Okay, welcome everyone to GW Coders. Uh, it's the last day of March, 2023. Um, and before we get started with today's talk, which should be really interesting, I have a couple of announcements of upcoming events. Um, so on April 11th, so right after, um, well, I guess it's not our spring break after, so in two weeks, um, we'll have a workshop on data management plans um, and that will be offered through the GW libraries. Um, data management plans for any of you working on grants or grant supported research, you always have to submit a data management plan. So it includes everything from data privacy, security to eventually getting rid of data, cleaning it or making it publicly available. So that's Tuesday, April 11th at 10 a.m. in the library. On the 14th of April, so in two weeks, um, we will have GW coders that same day, but then at the same time we're doing that from 10 to 4.30, there's a symposium going on, I Am Not a Robot, The Entangled Futures of AI in the Humanities. Um, there'll be a variety of speakers from philosophy, um, English and the languages, uh, history and so forth, talking about AI and their role in the humanities and the humanities role in the future of AI. I'm actually speaking, I believe at 3.30 that afternoon. Um, so we can talk some about that and what I'm gonna be talking about when we meet on April 11th. Then lastly, I'll mention on Tuesday, April 18th, the libraries are offering a workshop on creating your O-R-C-I-D, ORCID, um, and for SCI and BIC, which is a mouthful to say, but these are systems that help you manage your profiles across different scientific organizations. So if you apply for NIH or NSF funding, you would have to have one of these, or they would encourage you to have one of these. Um, and ORCID then allows you to connect your different science activities together. So that's just a few of the upcoming workshops that I wanted to make mention. Um, as people start coming in, um, welcome. To, and we're gonna go ahead and start out with our session today. We have Donovan, who is a computer science student at UC Santa Cruz out in California. And he's been doing some really interesting um, development on that both integrates with ChatGPT and with YouTube. And he's gonna talk us through some of the code um, and his experience in developing this neat little project that I think we'll learn a lot from. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Donovan, to introduce yourself and talk about what you're up to. Yeah, hi, so I'm Donovan DeVizze. I'm a student at UCSC, which is UC Santa Cruz. It's like uh, UC basically in the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, here. And just recently, I participated in the Cruise Hacks, which is just a hackathon we held at our school, where you just basically you just create a project, you you know plan it out, design it full flesh, and then you create it in just two days. So it's a lot of people staying up like all night, just coding and stuff. And hackathons are really great. All of you should try it if you can. And I'll go ahead and share my screen. and show the website that I created. So this is reInvent and it has AI highlighted because it uses AI to like reinvent the way you learn basically. So how it works is you take a YouTube link, which it works best with lectures. So let me grab a any lecture video, I'll grab this one. You put it in, you press analyze, and then it'll fetch the transcript from the video. It'll train a chat bot for you. This is an hour long, so it might take a few seconds. Give it a moment, and it's gonna be working with the back end. It uses React as a front end. React.js, and then it's hosted 
using this other service called Nginx, which I'll talk about later, to communicate with the back end, which is hosted using Flash and Google Cloud. And Flask is just a Python uh, hosting service. So give it a second. And I will mention that all of this is hosted open source on GitHub. And then it's hosted using Google Cloud. But for longer videos, it takes a bit longer. Here, let me pull up actually another video. So is it pulling the transcript or is it creating the transcript as you go? Let me just grab um, just a random video right here. Some videos. Sorry, my internet went out a bit. Okay. Let's try with this link. There we go. This other video had a bad transcription. So you put in the YouTube video and then you can start asking questions about it. So I'll just ask, what are the main points of the video? And then I'll give you the chat bot's answer, which is trained using only the video and nothing outside of it. So I won't give you like hallucinations about like, other areas of knowledge will only use information that's contained in the video and then also give references to the timestamps that are most related to your question so here it says the main point of the video are that 80,000 hours is a nonprofit organization that provides all this we expanded on one of these things uh what evidence is true advice And then it'll expand on that if possible. If I go here, you'll see that it's talking about decision making tools, which is part of its answer. So this is really good for if you want to study a very long lecture, if you want to find a place in a very long lecture, or honestly, any YouTube video where you just need to find a place to talk about something or simply you don't want to watch the video and you want to uh, kind of learn about what's inside of it. And so now I will go over the code, the beautiful code here. All right, so I know the back end is more important to all of you, but the front end, I'll go over really quickly. It's hosted, it's sort of created using React, which is just a JavaScript framework. It's basically the most popular JavaScript like web app framework right now. It's really fast to just on the website. And uh, you can build for a static website as well, which is very nice. So that's supposed to be using React. Uh, I can go over the actual way it communicates with the back end a bit later, but here is the Python code that actually grabs embedding this stuff. So how it works is it uses Flask, which is right here. And the way Flask works is basically you initialize a Flask app and you create different functions. And the way websites work, they use get and post requests to get data. So whenever you go to a website, typically it's going to be using a get request and then asking whatever server is hosting that website for some data. So we create the Flask app and we create different functions. So each of these functions 
store some code that is only called if you go to that specific URL. And of course, this little slash validate comes after the uh, the base of the URL. So, for example, this is already hosted right now. If I went to reinvent.com slash API slash, um, let's go to just ping. You can see that it's actually posted online with raw JSON. You can go and see the API outputs. So that's how APIs work. They literally just places you can request for data, request data from, and then also send data for them to process and then send you a response. So now let's go over some of these functions. So we have four main resources. A resource is just one of those website tags. So we have one for pinging the server, making sure the server is actually up. Uh, in development, it wasn't always up, but now it usually is. And then one for validating the URL to make sure it's actually a YouTube URL. The way that works is I hear the pink command, just send a message. So it validates the URL by creating a YouTube object in Python. And this little YouTube module is very nice. It just, it's easy to see if it's actually a video or not because it will return an error. So we just surround it in a try catch block. And if there was an error, um, it will return invalid. And then we handle that in the actual front end code. Okay, so that's, that's how you validate the URL. And then generating the transcript for it is the second step. So let's look at that. So as you'll notice, we have a lot of these session.get methods. And what that's for is when you use an API maker, so like Flask, um, Flask is the only one for Python really. Another one, um, you, you can use JavaScript as well for kind of creating, actually Python's better for APIs. But basically what this, what this is for is you need to store variables across sessions. So when a user goes to your website, right? Remember that nothing, nothing uh, is magic in this world. So all, all of their interaction is controlled with this code right here. So if we don't use this, for example, let's say we don't have uh, sessions for every user. Every time you enter a URL, it would store the variable. Let's say the URL variable, right? It would store the variable. But then let's say while you're using that website, someone else goes and stores their own URL. Now it would change that variable and the person, person A would be affected by that because now they're using the same variable as someone else. It would get complicated. So what you do instead is you create a session uh, object, which basically allows you to store kind of user data um, either in the browser, which is what's commonly done, done using cookies. As you'll see, if I just control shift I, if you go over to storage, GitHub has all these different cookies about you. And um, what I do instead is because we're storing, storing very large files, I have to use a file system way of storing things. So the browser can only store so much as a cookie. So instead, they're storing on the remote server that's hosting our website, and then it's deleted after it's not used anymore. So, so now when we're generating the transcript, we uh, get the URL thing, the URL uh, session variable. We get the transcript. So this is how we get the actual transcript of the video. Thankfully, YouTube auto transcribes every YouTube video that's on there besides, I believe, music videos and very long documentaries. Uh, transcription process for those are a bit weirder. So um, 
we're still adding support for that. But this will very quickly get a transcript for the entire video, which we used to do uh, manually using OpenAI's Whisper service, Whisper API. So the Whisper API would just auto transcribe a video using kind of chat GPT like uh, models basically. And, but that took very long. It took like an hour for, it took like, let's say we put an hour video, an hour long video, it would take like a minute. Whereas this takes about 10 to 20 seconds and it scaled up too far. So we just, we started using this. The thing is, we just added support for articles as well. Um, <clears throat> so it works nicely. That it it's, it's all very fast because we just use beautiful suit for articles, which parses HTML, gets all the text off of it. And then YouTube transcript API for the uh, YouTube videos. So in the future, if we were to add MP4 access, we would not be able to use either of these and instead we'd have to use Whisper. But currently this is a very fast solution. So um, if it's a video, we're going to go through the entire transcript and then create a string. Basically, this is like a sentence from the transcript. Remove all the non-ASCII characters, which YouTube sometimes lays in the transcription. Do some more parsing, and then we... Um, oh yeah, so the way the transcripts say it is it has these little start keywords. And then put that all in a string. We append the final sentence to a dictionary, um, or actually a list of dictionaries. And so basically we're creating this kind of data frame of every sentence in the transcription. We have the text. The start, which is the start time of the sentence, which is really nice. YouTube provides that. And then um, this end variable, which is irrelevant. Um, I won't maintain the, the back end as much. So sorry if I sound a bit out of touch with the code. But anyway. So are you breaking that. those into eight chunks? Is that what that count? eight thing was at the bottom of that? Or what's yeah, the count? exactly. Okay, so you're breaking each transcript into eight chunks, basically. Yeah, chunks of eight. So because we can't really timestamp every word individually, it would get a bit confusing. So we just timestamp um, chunks of eight words. Oh, uh, okay. And then we store our transcripts as a session variable. So we already created our data frame of stuff, and then we're going to turn it into a pandas data frame. Uh, right here, we're just initializing for the pandas data frame. Pandas is a very, very powerful module that has a lot to learn from it. So I cannot explain all of it, but this data frame object just makes it easier for a lot of different functions operate strictly through a data frame instead of like a dictionary. So. Um, create into a data frame, and then we can use this doc embeddings method, which is from the helper file. So let's go to the helper file. So this uses get embedding. So this is just parsing the data for OpenAI, I believe. All this stuff would be on the docs. So basically, if you want to create your own little OpenAI thing, OpenAI, uh, I guess, file or just, there's a lot of examples on OpenAI. So if you went to OpenAI APIs, you can check out all the different uh, models they have. 
and I'll show you examples with this. So if you do like try Dolly, it'll show you how to use it. And that's where a lot of our code comes from is just the documentation they have on there. So let's go back to this. All right, so we created, we created a data frame. We've gotten the embeddings and we store the embeddings in the session variable and then also the video length in the session variable. The video length we keep just to see like how many timestamps to return. Because if it's like a 30 minute video, we'll add more time, we'll fill more timestamps than if it were like a five minute video. And then all that process is different if it's not a video. So if it's for example, which we just added support for, it will um, do a very similar process, except the transcript is not transcript, it's already just wall of text. So we parse it differently, which is right here. All right, so once we have the embeddings, which is basically just uh, a data frame version of the transcript, we can now use this answer question method. So this is called every time we ask a question on the website. So if I put back in this YouTube video, down in the chat box, every time I do this, it sends a get request to, you know, reinvent slash API slash ask question using post. So post requests allow you to send actual, uh, send more data in the request. You can do it with get requests as well, but that's too much. It's uh, a bit more complicated. It's harder to store the data. So what it does is it goes here and maintains in the post request, which, wait, let me see. Post, where's the actual post request? Oh, right here? No, right here, content. So this content variable, it just comes with this uh, post function. This is a benefit of Flask. It makes it very simple to just read post request data and uh, get request data as well. So the way to make a post request rather than a get request, see over here is a get request. You use get requests, if you don't want to have as much data in the um, in the request, I use post requests when I want to actually send data um, itself because it sends an object which you can store data in instead of a get request where you store data in the actual link itself. So we get the question. Um, we use this helper function, answer query with context, which basically after we trained the bot, oops, answer query with context. So, see a lot of this is just straight from the documentation. So it's, I'm not actually sure, sure what all of this does. But so this just constructs, I guess, and uh, the actual prompts we ask the chatbot because this is a, at the end of the day, how this works is we tell the DaVinci model, which is basically just ChatGPT of OpenAI, we tell it that it's going to be working for this reInvent service where it needs to answer questions about the video. And we tell it to not fabricate anything, to only use. Uh, stuff it learned in the video, et cetera. So it should only use that stuff. So we need construct a prompt to ask it. And then we also include the document embeddings in there and the data frame, which DaVinci can read. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Up above, you're setting the temperature. And if I understand, right temperature is kind of how much creativity you're giving to chat GPT to, and that's why you set it to zero. Is that correct? Yes. It's a good observation. Yes. The temperature. We set it straight to zero because you want this to be literally just to learn in the video. No like fabrications or 
you know, hallucinations. That's good. We have a little, little comment here to say that. But yeah, so basically there's a lot of that. There's a lot of tr like training the data model, training the chatbot before we even give it transcription. We need to ensure that it knows where it's working and it knows that it's not going to, uh, it's not trying to give the right answer when there is no right answer. And then down here, basically, we just asked the, we asked the chatbot the question, including the document embeddings and the data frame, and then it'll send back an answer, which we return uh, in this little JSON object. And so this is really great because it allows us to, Flask is really great because it allows us to combine Python code, just raw Python code with a front end. So if I go back here to the front end, source and then app.js is where the majority of the code is stored. This is all just straight up JavaScript. This is code that is shows every little box, every little YouTube player, um, all these different chatbot messages. This is what I code myself, actually. So I can explain it a bit better. But yeah, basically, all these different fetch requests is it fetching to the Python API. So once you click this button right here, it'll check the server status, which uh, send a get request to the to the Flask API straight to the slash ping URL. So that means it'll go straight to, as we look down here, the ping resource, because it defines it right here. And just send back this, just to make sure the server is up. But yeah, that's how the JavaScript front end communicates with the Python back end. And all of this is hosted uh, not on Heroku, which a lot of people usually do, but it's hosted actually itself on Linux, which is similar to Apache, but it's a bit better because we're using a, uh, a Flask backend. So would you like me to go through the kind of hosting process now? Yeah, I think that would be good. Um, does anyone else have questions on kind of how he's using the JavaScript on the front end with the React JS and then the Flask on the back end? Um, I mean, we did the session a couple of weeks ago on the Django, which is a much larger Python framework for web apps, um, whereas Flask is lighter. As you could see, there aren't that many pieces to a Flask um, backend. So, all right, Flask is very straightforward. You just all you need to do is import it in, initialize the object. Um, this is here to allow cross. Is it cross origin resource? S. I don't know what the S is, but that's needed. There's a lot of different hosting aspects that are in this Flask code that you wouldn't need if you were strictly running it in a development environment. So yeah, this is, this is all just Flask code. You simply add resources, which is where you just add the class name because it's actually uses class, uh, it's just OLP, uses classes to define all this stuff. And then it takes in this little resource module. Cool. Okay, if we don't have questions yet, then we can go ahead into how you're hosting on, because you said you're host, hosting with Google, right? Right. And also feel free to ask questions anywhere in this. I can always cycle back to another stage. Okay. So Google Cloud. Right now I'm SSHing into it. Um, Google Cloud is essentially just a computer very far away that's a bit much more powerful than my own computer. And the biggest perk is that it's running 24 seven. 
because I cannot have my laptop running 24 seven running this website. <clears throat> so having a AWS or Google Cloud service just makes things infinitely possible. So it's just a Linux environment. If you've never used Linux, it's just a much kind of simpler, it's like a command prompt in Windows or a terminal Mac. It's more similar to a terminal Mac. And it's just a place <clears throat> you can execute a lot of different commands very fast. So if I go into my repos, into the reinvent, see LS is just listing files and she's going into them. So here is all the code on the website. If I go into the front end, because this is really is a pull of my uh, GitHub repo. In the front end, we have this build and basically I've set up the hosting service to just read straight from this build folder for all the server files. <clears throat> so I go in here. This is like, it dumbs down all of the React JavaScript code straight into HTML. So if I were to print out this little index.html file, it's just all JavaScript code, which is really ugly. And you can actually make that better using something called server-side rendering, and which takes all of your JavaScript code and turns it into HTML code. It's a good idea if you want to create like a professional website that web scrapers will read. Will read. Um, keep that in mind. And now get out of this build folder and back to the hosting. So hosting with Nginx, very tedious process, but I learned from scratch, so it's not too bad. There's always documentation. Um, so what I just did is I went to this HTC folder. This is just where you find a lot of the different modules on Linux. And then Nginx, this is where all of the config is stored and everything related to Nginx is stored. So the way to define everything, the way it works, right? You have Nginx, which simply is there to host uh, a static web page. And then you have the config, which is where you tell it what web page you want to, or what files you want to actually host and what port you want to host it on. Because your computer, if you want to host, basically your computer has a port system because if you want to host two different things at once, um, if without ports, they would be hosted on the same URL that would clash. So find the port. And here's the config file. So this is where all the actual Nginx code is uh, put. And stuff related to my server is right here. We put in the server name, the root, and then right here is the most important part. So the reason we use Nginx over Apache is because Apache doesn't have this proxy proxying feature, which is really good. So this is why hosting this website was like, took as long as it did to make it, at least for me, because I was learning this all from scratch. Um, right here, see this little security thing? Yeah, that doesn't mean the website is actually um, certified at all. That just means it uses encryption in the data process. This was made, this uh, security receipt was made entirely through command line code. So I could be a, you know, evil guy out in a cave making malicious code. And I could still get my site secured. So never trust these things. But the issue with this, so basically this is called an SSL certificate. It means that it's using SSL encryption for all, uh, all data transactions. So this is this is SSL certified, but my API that's hosted locally. Let me show you how it's hosted. It's hosted using a Tmux client. This basically allows you to have two terminals at once. So here's the back end right here. It's running. So it's hosted. I'll just stop it. 
I should I don't I shouldn't stop it, but it's hosted using G Unicorn, which is uh just a it's not it's not very important, but it's a little module that just runs Python code in a in a production environment. So there's development and there's production. You wanna when you're hosting your website, run everything in production. Don't try to run things in development. It's all meant to be run in production mode. Uh, so this is just production. Uh, flat production flask server, which is hosted using Unicorn. And let's go back to here. So my flask code is running on port 5000. And it's not SSL certified because it's very difficult to SSL certify a port on your computer, which I did try to do. I tried to do a lot of other things before going to Nginx. Um, it doesn't work. But here I'm just basically creating or I'm take I take a URL, which is right here. So I do the slash API section of the URL. I proxy pass it straight to port 5000, which means that I'm able to access the data from my on SSL certified uh, you know, backend flash server from an SSL certified website, which you aren't usually allowed to do. Usually you get this, you usually get these, what's it called? Mixed origin errors, because one is SSL, one isn't. It's very unsafe, you know, you can, if, if there weren't errors for that, websites could like trick you, I guess, with like taking your data and then passing it through a uh, on SSL certified thing. But this is all done in, the client side, so you're allowed to proxy pass. But yeah, so that's that's why Nginx is very good. It allows you to use this proxy pass feature. This stuff is just for cross origin requests. Um, that's a, that's just more communication stuff from front and the back end. So anything you had outside of the API subfolder would still then be with the SSL certified then, you're just passing only those things that are API associated through the proxy? Right, yeah. The only thing that SSL certified are stuff with the reInvent um, base. Okay. So everything from reInvent will be SSL certified, but this allows me to access on SSL certified stuff because it's hosted on the same network. So I, it's like, you're not going and passing it over to another network. Um, technically it's still kind of SSL certified in a way. But yeah, this is CL is managed by CertBoss stuff. This is how you get an SSL certificate very easily. There's actually documentation on it right here. It's incredibly fast. See, you just run some console commands and you get your website SSL certified. So this is all hosted on Google Cloud, which is, I believe, very similar to AWS. I had that right here, this is where it is. So there's a lot of different options in Google Cloud. Just like AWS, they kind of flood you with information, but I mean, you can just get a very simple VM that's hosted remotely which is all I needed. So I went to Compute Engine and VM instances and made a new one with basically the lowest possible specs on the computer, just because it's very cheap. Also, also, this is all completely free because they have a free trial. It's incredibly generous, it's like 90 days. Um, so it's all hosted in this remote Google Cloud PC out yonder. But yeah, that is essentially the entire hosting process of reInvent. And whatever questions you guys have, go ahead and ask them now. So you're using the OpenAI API. How much are you getting charged? I know it's a small amount per token, but I was just curious, right. is it adding up on you or? Are you still like so, under a $20 investment at this point? 
Yeah, no, definitely under $20. It's actually, I'm working on this with a team. So my teammate who works on the back end, who writes the back end code, is uh, he's the one paying for the API fees, which he's been charged about less than $20 at this point still. You get charged per token. I wonder if I can find the actual cost. Yeah, because I was the playing around fee. with one similar to yours where you could upload a PDF um, and then ask it questions. And I had done it in CoLab. And then I was just watching and it was like three cents a call. Like when I asked the question, it would increment by about three cents. But I didn't have the 500 token parameter put on it. Yeah. So that's probably what's helping you keep the pricing down too, because you had that token parameter. Yeah, so as you see, it, it it goes per 1K tokens. You get charged like a fraction of a penny. So the one that we're using is DaVinci, not GPT-4. Uh, let's see where is it? I think, I think they just call it basically chat GPT on this. Oh, right here? Oh, no. Yeah, I think we use this one right here. Oh, okay. Essentially. So you get paid, yeah, you, you get charged like a fraction of a penny for every one case. How much is it charging token. for the embedding? The embedding? Is that on that site? I'm not exactly sure because I don't have the key myself, but considering oh, okay. the embedding is about like 500 to 1,000 tokens, I believe. Um, okay, so you're probably paying less than a penny for each embedding of it. Exactly, yeah. We, we've tried to limit it as much as possible. That's pretty yeah, amazing. You can not, offer it so cheap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, it's like no one else can make the type of models that OpenAI and AI are making. So like, they really can't just charge anything they want, though. Because these models, they're easy to make a simple one. Like it's, it's easy to make a simple chat GPT, but the actual level that GPT and GPT-4 are on now takes massive computing power. So the only way we're getting access to it are through uh, APIs, sadly. But maybe in the future, it'll be easy to make your own chat GPT that's like just as powerful. But yeah. And here's the actual code I can put it in chat if anyone wants to look through it. Any other questions? John, I know you probably have a question or you're eating a sandwich or something. <laughs> Both at the same time, but I joined so late that I missed like I think most of the important parts. So I'm still not figuring out like what we're doing <laughs> i miss, the, I miss so it. much that's why we're recording on so. over yeah um but i'll go back and watch the youtube here yeah feel free to look through the code as well it's just a uh youtube q a chat bot <clears throat> that uses yeah. davinci's model or just basically chat gbt at open ai and does a semantic search through the entire transcript of a YouTube video and allows you to ask questions about what's inside of it. So this is actually really relevant to, uh, so one of my, uh, is, is, I mean, who's on the call? I'm looking, no, not here. Okay. One of my students is, is looking at potentially using YouTube data to do some social media analysis. Like most of that type of work has been done on Twitter and Twitter is a bit of a mess now. So we're looking to other platforms and possibly using YouTube. So you're able to grab the transcript from YouTube directly or you're not having to convert it yourself. Yeah, this is completely awesome. unrelated to what uh, the chat part of it. I'm actually just like, where do you get <laughs> the transcript to a YouTube video? No, that's, uh, that's, that's fine. It's right here, here. So YouTube transcript API is actually its own module on Python. Oh man, that's awesome. Okay, I did not know. We were just literally like two days ago, Jack talking about this. I'm like, I wonder if that's possible because, like, they I know they have auto-generated captions and stuff. It's like, so they must have transcripts of every video. 
And I'm like, can we get it or do we have to do it ourselves and run it through some other thing? So yeah, Python looks like, like we can get it. Literally anything you want to do in Python, you can just probably do with a module, honestly. Yeah. Well, now I know. So that's a possibility. Yeah. And before before we used YouTube Transcript API, we used Whisper, which is OpenAI's version of auto. That's what we were going to use. We were talking right. about using Whisper to transcribe it ourselves. And then, but I'm like, but do we need to? Because if it's already been done, then yeah. Exactly. No, getting a transcript is about 10 times faster than creating yourself with Whisper. Yes, that that's that was my expectation. But I, I was like, I, I know they already do this. I just didn't know if we had access to it as the public. So uh, that's pretty cool. Um, All right. And I was actually talking with, I was talking with my friend earlier about Whisper and how I think Whisper could be a lot better if they used chat GPT to determine what the next most reasonable word would be. Yeah. So not just what does the word sound like, does the word make sense in the sentence, which chat GPT is perfect at. It's basically like phone, iPhone autofill. In that regard. Yeah, so I think that's a very, very good autocomplete. <laughs> so right. Or be much advanced, I think. Yeah, it could it could even improve by either doing it in real time with it or post processing. I don't know, to some extent, like looking back at the last several words, you know, and and so it could it could it could basically in real time transcribe, but then have chat GPT going over it afterwards and reflecting and going, uh, this probably wasn't the same word. It was probably this one instead. And like, just anyway, uh, yeah, it could exactly. certainly be further improved with their own tools. Um, well, and Whisper is open source. So if you wanted to improve it, you could do it yourself. <laughs> you could run, it's an open source model, unlike <laughs> at GBT, which is a closed source model. Right. But they made Whisper open source in the fall. There are a couple of people running different versions of it. If you search around, there's some people like in the Czech Republic and stuff doing some pretty interesting things with Whisper too. Yeah. One step ahead of even what um, OpenAI is offering. Yeah, look at that. I actually think maybe where it could be most useful is different languages in the videos. I mean, we're, I don't know what the YouTube API gives you as a transcript, but I'm going to guess it's the native language of whatever spoken. So if it's like a Spanish video, maybe it's a Spanish transcript, you yeah, know, I'm but you have to sure do, exactly. I'm, like, cause we're thinking about looking at a bunch of different possible ideas with what you could do with YouTube, but what's actually in the video, like the content of the video. That's why Twitter has been so popular is because it's a text based platform. So it's really great to immediately do some analysis on that. And so we're going to basically, yeah, just do text analysis on what's in the YouTube video. But, and also, you know, what are the comments? How are people reacting to it? And so this is, uh, yeah, completely separate from what you presented on. But uh, <laughs> um, but that's yeah, that's an idea that I think is really interesting because you could have multilingual videos. And then you're going, wait a minute, what do I, what do, I do with this? Well, I probably could use one of these tools to immediately translate it too. And um, anyway. And comp for comments, I guess you're probably planning on using like Beautiful Soup 4, maybe like just requests and Beautiful Soup 4 for reading those. Yeah, I mean, any anything, if that works, then that's the easiest thing to do to quickly grab it and parse it. Um, so right. if that's immediately accessible or if they might also be available through the API, I don't know. But um, if not, that's we'll just scrape them. Possibility. It might just be there. I mean, that's what I mean. I, I we, we, you're, you're, we're talking about less than 48 hours of a conversation we had of like, maybe this is an idea we could do. <laughs> this yeah. is very fresh in my mind of like <laughs> what we could do. And that's why I, I wanted to call in earlier, but I wanted to see what you're doing with YouTube in particular. Um, so pretty cool stuff. Um, right. This is made from a hackathon. Uh, so it's like literally we just came up with an idea like what if we can use it? Yeah, I'm gonna talk about what's inside of a YouTube video, right? So yeah, yeah, I came yeah. with that idea and just coded it out in literally two days, just because of how <laughs> easy it is to get rough and running with Python. Did you use ChatGPT to like solve problem solve as you're debugging and like building this? I think I did a couple times, but the thing is that 
ChatGPT does not work very well when there's a lot of different moving parts. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, that's been my experience. File, it would be yeah. very good, but yeah, so when you're building something of an architecture and it's a lot of moving pieces combined, it, it's not very good. I've I've been trying to build a survey platform <laughs> and I'm asking it questions for things I don't know how to do. And it's like, basically, I don't know either. And I'm like, okay, well, so when you're inventing something completely novel, it, it has a hard time with it. Um, right. And I'll never say it doesn't know. It'll like try to give you an answer that looks yeah. very right. <laughs> it doesn't work. But there's just one, <laughs> there's just one issue with it. It's hard to figure yeah. out. Yeah. Well, this is cool. I mean, that you've made this open is, is, really nice i might play around with it myself and what you did miss too john is they've recently added pdf support so you don't have to just use youtube if you had a pdf ah, nice. you wanted to do the same which is there's chat pdf which does something similar um yeah. but they limit you to like a 20 page file or something like that yeah here that's reduced their upload. embedding cost mm -hmm. uh, but I did this in a, a podcast industry. the other day where someone uploaded like all the works of an author from the 1700s, Jonathan Swift, and then had uh, like a podcast interview with Jonathan Swift as ChatGPT would interpret based on his writings. Um, so I think we're just starting to see some of that cool types of applications where you can create these embeddings so easily to focus in on just certain, like in this case, the embedding is just the transcript, but the embedding could be all the writings of John Helveston. And then I could yeah. have a conversation with John Helveston. About, You'd learn a lot about choice modeling and other boring topics. <laughs> that that's what I'm interested in. Hey, um, yeah. You can imagine where it's going to take websites like, if you want to go learn about something, you can just go and have yeah. a chat about it with the website on the topic. So like you can yes. have a chat just Customer about support will be infinitely um, better. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, I'm I was thinking actually this would be a a fun thing to possibly try to host sometime through coders is like a GPT hackathon, like kind of event where we just try to see what can we do with this thing. And just just have some dedicated time to play around with it more because if you just take a whole day off and say, I'm going to play with this. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cool things you can do that are just and in fact, you can use it to, like I said, help help you. If you don't know how to use this package, you can say, teach me how to use this package <laughs> and uh, exactly. see what we can come up with. So that's, Brian, what I was also kind of thinking about yeah. as a proposal. We were emailing on proposal idea. You could get we could get with George Hacks too, which is our hackathon group. Yeah. So I was thinking of some sort of proposal to fund some workshops and hackathon events and just sort of events where we are exploring what can be done with AI and um, yeah, sort of application-based things. Like, yeah, what, what kinds of tools can we come up with very quickly? Um, I don't know. It seems like it would fit with that topic. That's a that's a conversation we should talk about offline. Yeah, <laughs> but um, definitely, this is an excellent demonstration of that. You know, what can you do with a couple of days of time? Um, pretty impressive. Yeah, maybe the hackathon hosts can like give out API keys as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't cost much, but it's better not to make people pay for it themselves. Right. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to stop the recording there just mm -hmm. so we have it, and I'll send it to you later, John.